Hello, welcome everyone to today's webinar with WSET. This is our events hub. My name is Joseph. Um, I am going to move us on really quickly to a checklist of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, that will all become apparent why. Um, you've logged into a session which is called How to Taste Wine Without Drinking Wine. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. I am going to switch straight to this next slide because there are a few things to get ready for today. Hopefully you got this in the invitation or in the advertising for the event, um, but I just thought I'd flash this up as soon as possible so you can get everything prepared. Um, so what we're going to be doing is something that's quite interactive, um, something where we're making up lots of different solutions of water and to sort of fully take part in that. The best things to have with you are a jug of water. So I've got my jug of water here. Um, four glasses and they can be any glasses if you've got wine glasses brilliant if you've just got tumblers water glasses that's absolutely fine we're not going to be tasting wine today as the title suggests um two or three grapes to hand really good if you're sitting there in a small group then go and get a small bunch of grapes if you've got them if you've got black grapes even better doesn't really matter though um if you've just got white grapes with you and uh, that's absolutely fine Two slices of lemon, mine look a bit more like chunks or segments of lemon, um, but any size of, of slice of lemon would be really good. A tea bag, just bring the tea bag along, you don't need to boil the kettle at this point. Uh, we're not going to boil the kettle at all, in fact, for the session. Bring that along and we'll add it to some water in a minute, um, but just bring the tea bag for now. And then any sugar that you have to hand, basically the plainer the sugar, the better. Um, so white plain sugar, I've got some castor sugar with me today, anything a bit like icing sugar would also be fine. Okay, so something nice and simple plain sugar that you'd use for baking. And we're going to use these all in a minute. Okay. I'll come back to that. Um, just to say hello properly now, my name is Joseph Hallam. I work at WSET in our business development team. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an educator and I'm someone that actually trains educators who go on to teach our courses as well. Um, most of my time is spent looking after our network of course providers around the world. If you don't know anything about WSET, we're the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. Uh, so every year about 100,000 people or more um, do one of our courses and qualifications related to wines, spirits or sake. And we have real beginner one day courses just to introduce people to the world of drinks. And then we have programs such as our level four diploma in wines, which is a two year part time study course, uh, really to expert level and everything in between. So we've got one central school in London, but the rest of the time we're running these courses through third party course providers. And that's my job uh, looking after that brilliant network of course providers all around the world uh, to make sure they they provide the best possible courses for you guys. Um, so that's me. I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to do today as well. Um, before I go on to the content, there are a couple of functions. You're all probably very familiar with Zoom by now, um, but we've got a chat box. So absolutely tell us where you where you're sitting at home today, uh, where you're joining us from. Um, also, as I said, it's quite an interactive session. So if you just want to make a few comments about what you're experiencing when we taste some of these samples through the session, absolutely do that. I will try and get to as many questions at the end of today's sessions. We're going to be about 25 minutes, half an hour today. Uh, and I'll try and get to as many questions as possible at the end. This is part of our events hub program. If you want to catch up on past episodes, just head to WSET's YouTube channel. Everything is available through that. Right, hopefully I, I'm sort of picturing everyone scrambling around at home into their kitchens and trying to look through their cupboards for when they last baked a cake and find their sugar and everything. Hopefully people are getting themselves together by now. Um, this is obviously jumping the gun a little bit. I, I, what I thought I'd do as well is just talk about next steps after today's session. Today's session is really a sort of beginner level session, thinking about your palate, thinking about how we taste things, thinking about different sensations in our mouth. 
Um, but I just wanted to give you a few sort of hints for what you could do next after attending today's session if you wanted to develop these tasting skills. There is nothing better than getting to know different fruits and food flavours by really simply and quite obviously tasting those foodstuffs. Um, we have that there are available um, out there sort of different tasting packs and things like that that are specifically um, for wine aromas and flavors and you can use those to be honest me I personally find that going out and finding the fresh food is the best thing to do head to your local market head to your local supermarket buy these things cook with these things taste them really think about those different flavors compare things next to each other when was the last time you actually just tried a, a red cherry next to a black cherry for example try those two things next to each other how, how are they different what is that flavor profile Okay. When it comes to wine, there's this great mystique about people being able to stick their nose in a glass and just tell you where that wine came from, how old it is, what great variety, where it was made, the particular vineyard. Okay. That is a, a rare skill um, and takes years and years of practice and dedication to get to. That is not our first step into the world of wine. Okay know what you're tasting so i put up here this lovely um label from a particular bottle of wine know exactly what you're tasting know what you're expected to taste there okay uh this is it's like anything else if you were preparing to run a marathon you would not throw yourself straight into that marathon you would build it up slowly slowly practice practice and it's the same with tasting wine it's a skill that we practice and modify as we go through our journey with wine know what you're tasting on the back of a bottle of wine or on um, an online website uh, or online shop it will give you a description a tasting note of what that wine maybe tastes like okay you don't have to test yourself straight away have a look at those flavors see if you can go and find them in that glass of wine okay make life easy for yourself especially to start with and the other thing here is to get some guidance. Nothing better than actually just sitting down with someone who's quite an experienced taster and knows quite a lot about wine to take you through a tasting. And that could be something quite casual in a wine shop. Loads of wine shops will have open bottles of wine and you can get a member of staff over and say, can you just tell me what should I be picking up here? What, what flavors can you detect? Is this, a, is this a full bodied wine? What does that mean? Okay, you can just have a conversation with them. Obviously what we do at WSET is a little bit more formal than that. And we involve online and classroom courses really good place to have a, an educator in front of you who's got loads of wine qualifications loads of experience and they can guide you through these different aromatic profiles and th these different sensations that you're experiencing whilst you taste wine so get some guidance that is a really key tip good i'm hoping by now we're all set up and ready to go uh, but just to flash up this checklist one more time jug of water four empty glasses Two or three grapes uh, would be brilliant. Two slices of lemon, one tea bag, and some white sugar, if you got it. And at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen, okay? Because from now on, it gets a bit more interactive um, and we'll see what everyone experiences. Good, so the place we're gonna start today is with these grapes we have in front of us. Now, you might not know this for certain, some of you will definitely know this, but just to confirm that any wine that's out there is, is made from a grape, okay, or made from a bunch of grapes or lots of grapes picked across a vineyard. This is what we're using to make our wine. It's a really good place to start because just by eating a grape, we can already see some complexity of flavour and different sensations. So what I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, just pop the grape in your mouth and chew away on that. Okay, so various different things going on. There's some juiciness. There's a bit of sweetness. Okay, there is the flavors of the grape. And that maybe sounds quite obvious, but it tastes like a grape. A little bit of dryness as well. Even as like a basic step though, as we're sort of getting ready to taste wine, there are multiple sensations there. And it's quite hard to break it down. So it's worth us going one step further uh, and seeing if we can split this grape into constituent parts. And this is why we've got another grape to play with. So what I want you to do now, and this gets a little bit messy, is start to peel your grape, okay? 
And what we're doing here is we're just separating the skin from the pulp underneath. If you've got a black grape, like I have, what you will probably start to notice, especially as I put this down on a piece of paper in front of me, is that inside we've got the pulp. And the pulp itself, especially if we sort of break open into it, there's not actually any colour in the pulp. It's basically a green or see-through um, fleshy piece of fruit. Okay, the colour, and if you put this down on the book in front of you, you can see is all the colour is coming from the skin. Okay, that's actually lesson number one in winemaking. This is how we make red wines, is that during the fermentation of a red wine, all the skins, they remain in contact with the juice. And so that colour seeps out into the juice. Okay. The pulp doesn't have any colour. So if you separated the skins from the pulp, you could actually make a white wine from a black grape. And that happens all the time with a particular category of wine. And champagne is one of those. So traditional method sparkling wines, that happens all the time is you've actually got black grape varieties, but you're making a white wine. Okay, you just need to separate that skin before the fermentation process. Anyway, let's get back to what we're actually tasting from these different things. So what I want us to do now is just eat this fleshy part of the grape on its own. Okay, what are we getting now? Obviously, it's kind of the liquid component there. There's a lot of water that's going to go into the body of the wine, as it were. That's going to be the liquid that we end up with in our final bottle of wine. Okay, there's also the sugar and the sweetness coming through. So those sugars from that grape, they're contained within the flesh. All those sugars are going to be fermented and that's going to be turned into alcohol during the winemaking process. Okay, there's also that kind of fresh, tingly sensation. Okay, you might be feeling it at the sides of your mouth and that's acidity. Now, we don't think of grapes as being particularly acidic, certainly not compared to our lemons that we've got on our plates. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but there is some acidity there as well. Now I want us just to eat the grape skin on its own. And you'll get this with black grapes and you'll get it with white grapes as well. So same sensations. Okay, what we have there is quite a lot of dryness and bitterness. Not many sugars around here, not much acidity. Okay, you've got that kind of rough sensation. That's something called tannins. Okay, tannins are contained within red wines for the same reason that color seeps into those red wines. The tannin comes from the skins, and the, the skins are there during the fermentation. Then we're going to have tannin seep, seep into the liquid. Okay, so you can see where different parts of a wine structural profile and some of its flavors are coming from just by playing around with the grapes that we have. We're going to take this a step further and start to build these building blocks uh, into something a bit more complex going through, but we'll break it down first of all. Okay, what I want to do first of all with our glasses of wine uh, glasses, glasses of wine. We're not tasting wine today. Sorry, everyone, <laughs> to disappoint you. Um, now, one of these glasses we're just going to use for water. Really good just to have some water on its own so we can freshen up our palate in between uh, each tasting. What I want to do, though, with our first glass is just put our tea bag into the glass and then pour. And this is just tap water. OK, this is not hot water. Just pour water onto that tea bag. Okay, it doesn't need to be loads of water there. And what I want us to do is give it a little bit of a swirl. You might have seen people who enjoy tasting wine, some of your friends, some people who are selling you wines, giving it a big sort of swirl like this. If you're not very confident doing that, by the way, the easiest thing to do is just to hold the stem as if it was a pen and then put the um, 
put the glass flat on a table or something hard and then just draw little circles. OK, so pretend you're holding a pen and you're drawing little circles and you'll swirl that wine or that liquid in the same way. OK, so that's just our tea bag solution. And I'm going to put that to one side. We're going to come back to it because I want to let the tea seep into the water for a little bit. So just let that stand to the side for now. OK, so I'm going to take another empty glass and I'm just going to pour a little bit of water into the bottom. OK, if you do have sort of glasses or tasting glasses at home, I'm just putting in like 50 millilitres of water here, not very much at all. And what I want us to do, first of all, is focus on acidity. So I'm going to pick up my lemon ready to go. Now, I think at this point, it's really important for us to talk about the difference between um, aromatic profile, so flavours and aromas that we can smell and taste, and then structural components that we can find in a wine. These are two different things. The easiest way to understand it is that aromas and flavours are picked up by your nose. OK, so that means if this was a glass of wine, and I smelt it, I might be picking up different flavours like pineapple or white blossom or vanilla or leather, okay? And I'm smelling those aromas. If I was then to take a sip, what I would do is I would slurp the wine, and we'll practice that a little bit in a minute, slurp the wine. And what I'm doing there is and I, I'm encouraging um, the aromas to travel up the back of my uh, mouth into my nasal passages and I'm basically smelling those flavors again but from within my mouth okay so it's still your nose that is picking up those aromas of vanilla or leather or pineapple or white blossom okay it's still your nose doing the work there that's what we call the aromatic profile or the flavors associated with a particular wine. They're the things that really get written about in marketing because they sound uh, nice and poetic and really attractive flavors. They're the flavors that you need to experiment with different foods in your supermarket, take them home, taste them, see what they actually smell and taste like. But that's not the whole story with wine. There are also structural components. And those structural components are things that your nose cannot pick up. OK, so if this was a glass of wine and I smelt this, I would not be able to tell you whether this is high acid or low acid or medium acid. And that's what we would do in the tasting on a WSET course is start to sort of gauge what level is that acidity. I couldn't tell you what the tannin levels are like. I couldn't, unless something had gone really wrong, tell you what the alcohol was like. OK. Now, you might pick up a bit of alcohol burn if it's evaporating, but that's something we would associate with spirits, not really with wine level of alcohol. OK, so what I need to do there is put the liquid in my mouth and then I'm going to be using the sensors within my mouth, on my tongue, on my gums, on my cheeks, my teeth sometimes to pick up those structural components. And that's what we're going to play around with a bit more today. So. What I'll do is first glass of water that we're going to taste is squeeze just one segment of lemon juice into that water. OK, it doesn't matter. You don't have to get every drop of lemon juice in there. I've just managed to put a pip in there. That's fine. Make sure you don't swallow. Good. And again, if we want to, we can have a little practice swirling this around. So now, when I smell this, I can smell a little bit of lemon, as expected. And that's a that's a aromatic profile that we'd expect from lots of white wines, actually, is a, is a lemon flavour, lemon aroma. But I cannot tell you what the acidity level is like in this one. We're going to have to put it in our mouth. So let's have a little sip of this.
Okay, it's not wine, so I'm not spitting out. Normally, if I do one of these tastings and it was wine, I'd be spitting everything out. If you want to practice that in a minute, uh, we can do that uh, with the spittoo, and I'll show you just some of the technique of how we taste. This is not water any longer. There's something else going on here. Okay, there's this acidity level in that glass of water. You might sense a little bit of a tingling sensation. This is normally at the size of our tongue. People notice this quite a lot, or it might be sort of back, sort of on the, the inside of your jawline. Okay, you might notice a little bit of mouth watering sensation. Okay, your saliva starts to gather. One way of thinking about this is that acid actually is um, sort of a little bit of a mild warning to your palate that you need to get rid of that substance from your mouth. That's why your why your mouth starts to water when we put something acidic in it. That might be a little bit um, subtle for people. Okay, so what I want us to do is think of that as a relatively low level of acidity and then squeeze our second lemon into that same glass of water. And what we're doing here is we're basically seeing, can we tell the difference between something that's got a little bit of acidity compared to something that's got actually quite a lot of acidity just by doubling the amount of lemon juice in that liquid. Okay, so give it another little swirl. This time, if you want to practice your tasting technique, by all means do. What we'll do is take a little bit of the liquid into our mouth and we're going to tilt our head forward. And that is the most important part here. Tilt your head forward and then you're going to make a sort of backward sucking. You're going to sort of purse your lips like this and you're going to suck air through the liquid. OK, and what you're doing here is encouraging um, the liquid to move around your mouth. You're also encouraging some of the aromatic profile to travel up through your nasal passage at the back of your mouth. OK, but thinking crucially about acidity, acidity, acidity. How can I tell that this is a higher acid liquid than the thing I tasted before? Just to be completely appropriate, spitting it out as well, like we would do with a wine tumbler. OK, what you should notice now is that heightened level of acidity. If I just let my mouth relax a little bit, I can really tell that my saliva glands and it feels like it's coming from my jaw here again. They're starting, that's starting to water a lot because the acidity levels just increased here. And this is a really important thing to try and isolate in wine because all wines have a certain acidity level. If you've got any chemists around, all of the pHs of wine are below seven. Okay, it's always an acidic substance made from a fruit. But the acidity levels from wine, the acidity levels vary from wine to wine. Okay, so here we're picking up that increased level of acidity, and that's why our mouth is watering so much. Really important for us to sort of understand and try and isolate as we're tasting a wine. Good. Let's move on to another glass. Fill it up with water. Okay, so you should have kind of one remaining glass without anything in it. So I've got this is just normal water. I rinse my palate, and then I've got my lemon juice in one, and I've got my tea solution seeping away, steeping away over there. Right, let me fill up my gl last glass with water. Okay, and what I'm going to do now is take a little spoon of sugar. So I've just got a teaspoon, okay, a small spoon, and I've just put half a spoon of sugar onto that spoon. And I'm going to put it in my glass and again, swirl it around so that sugar starts to dissolve. Obviously, what we're doing here is seeing if we can isolate sweetness. Now, sweetness is a component of quite a lot of wines, but not all wines. There's a huge amount of dry wines out there. But it will be present in a small amount in lots of different wine styles, and I'll talk about those in a bit more detail in a minute. It also impacts something else, okay? 
um, and we'll come to that in a second. Right, hopefully that sugar's all dissolved now, and let's just have a sip of that. Okay. So that is what sweetness is like, really plain sweetness, plain sugar into a glass of water, what that feels like. What people sometimes confuse that with is really ripe smelling fruit, so something like the pineapple or those sweet baking spices like vanilla or nutmeg that we can smell in the wine. And we sometimes confuse them for sweetness. But when we describe sweetness specifically in a glass of wine, we're talking about how much sugar is there in there, how much of what we just put in this glass is present, okay, in terms of a sugary substance. Let's see if we can just increase that sugar level a little bit more. So I'm going to put again another half teaspoon into the same glass and give that a swell. What I want us to do this time is we'll obviously, obviously notice how the sweetness level increases. I just want to see if you notice anything else about how this liquid changes. Okay. Sugar level has gone up, definitely. Do you also notice how the texture has changed now as well? So what's happening is the body increases. If you think of a really sugary substance, something like honey or syrup, how thick that is, the sugar is impacting how viscous the liquid is. If you increase the sugar, the more viscous it gets. That is how we would describe body changing in a wine as well, is that sensation of mouth coating, thickness, viscosity, okay is increased at the same time you might want to just go back and have a little check of that if you want to try some plain water light like water is and then try a sugary substance again bit thick and gloopy isn't it okay so we're changing the body there Sugar has a massive impact on body and wines. That's why a lot of sweet wines are really thick, actually, when you pour them out of the bottle. The other thing that impacts body a lot is alcohol level. Obviously, we're not playing around with alcohol here, but it would have a similar um, impact on the liquid as well. Increase the alcohol level, body would also increase. Okay, so what I've got now is some of my sugary substance and left-handed less good at swirling uh, some of my lemon acidic uh, water here as well what i want you to do is maybe not all of it but just pour some of the sugary one into the lemon juice remember how high that acidity was before in that lemon juice where we squeezed two pieces of lemon in let's see how this changes a little bit when we've added some sugar in She's just going to swallow this to see what it's like. Okay, the acidity level's still there, but it's not the same kind of mouth puckering sensation. It's not as harsh as it was before. That sugar has helped to soften it. This happens all the time with wines. It's really obvious in dessert wines with sweet wines is that a high level of sugar is normally balanced actually by a high level of acidity. And that acidity is really, really important Otherwise, it would just start to taste a bit flabby, a little bit unstructured as a substance, a bit like just drinking honey or something. You might have one sip, you go, well, that's, that's too sweet for me. If you enjoy those wines, quite often what you enjoy is the acidity of that wine cutting through the sugar, helping to keep it fresh and palatable. So this is the idea of balance. When people talk about is a wine balanced, one of the things that could be balanced is sugar level, with acidity level? Are they keeping each other in check? Now, sweet wines aren't everyone's cup of tea. We'll come to tea in a minute. They're not everyone's favorite type of wine. Something that's really, really popular is sparkling wine. Sparkling wine that we think of as dry and quite often has high levels of acidity. 
very sort of clean and crisp tasting. The vast majority of the most popular sparkling wine styles, that's what they will do at the end of the wine production process, is they will put a little bit of sugar back into the wine. And they're doing that because the acidity levels are so high. If they didn't, it would be that same mouth puckering sensation. So they're just trying to balance the, those acidity levels because the way you make sparkling wine is you pick grapes when they're not very ripe. And when they're not very ripe, the acidity levels are really high at the start of the season. They need to balance it. The way they balance it is with sugar. OK, so we might think that we don't like sweet wines. But some of our most popular styles in the whole world of wine, actually, they use a little bit of sugar to keep that balance there. OK, so that is an important thing for us to consider. Good. Let us get to our final glass. So this nice brown liquid here, you might want to give it another swirl. I'm just going to keep the tea bag in there. OK, this would happen even better if you did boil the kettle, you would extract um yeah more color more flavor and more tannin which is what we're about to taste here okay but you can still do it just with tap water so give it a swirl and then I want you to have a little sip of this right and if anyone's enjoys drinking tea most of you don't enjoy putting a tea bag in there for 20 minutes or whatever we've left that for just then. What we've got there is a real dryness and a stringency, a bitterness, and that is tannin. The same substance that's in those grape skins that we tried at the start is in tea as well, and is in a lot of the red wines that we taste, all the red wines we taste, is a tannin level, and it's a bitterness. It's also a textural thing. OK, so you might notice that the, your teeth and your gums feel a little bit dry and grippy. OK, like you're going to sort of start chewing on your own gums a little bit. OK, because there's a texture there. And you might sort of lick that tannin off the front of your teeth. It's kind of a natural reaction to have. OK, so that is tannin. Again, with tannin, we can try and sort of balance that out with fruit flavor, with acidity, maybe a little bit. Um, sugar will also help. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pour all my lemon juice and sugariness in there and see if this helps to balance that tannin substance. Again, give it another little swirl. Glass is getting a little bit too full here. OK, and that dryness is still there. But suddenly, with a little bit of acidity, a little bit of sugar going on, it's balanced out. That's why lots of people, when they start drinking tea or they start drinking black coffee, they'll have sugar in it. OK, and people might stay there their whole life because it just helps to balance out some of that bitterness that comes through. And that's where sugar can be really important. for you. Good. OK, so what I wanted to do there was just sort of break down some different structural components that we find in wine. Just think about different parts of our mouth and different sensations in our mouth as we're tasting them and then put them all together and see how they combine when we taste them together, see how they help to balance each other out. And this is doing it with really relatively simple food stuff. If you to do with this, this with a glass of wine, even the most simple glass of wine, there'd be quite a lot of aromatic flavor profile going on at the same time. So this is why it's really good with your first step, sort of practicing your tasting skills, is to use some basic food stuffs like this, just to kind of train your palate with those different sensations. Right, what I'm gonna do, I've spent almost 35 minutes talking. Uh, I'm gonna have a little pause and just read some questions, see if anyone's got any questions coming through. So a really good question here. As acidity levels increase, do you tend to feel it in different parts of the mouth? The first time I felt it at the side of my mouth, but in the second one with more lemon, I felt it in my gums more. I would just say that what you're probably sensing there is more of your saliva glands active. Most people, acidity is sensed at kind of the sides of their mouth. It's actually sensed all over. 
but quite often you'll find that the sides of your tongue and also sort of that back corner where your sort of gum meets the back of your teeth meets the back of your tongue I get big mouth watering sensation from there okay and what you'll see people when they come and do their tasting exams with WSET you'll see lots of people relax their mouth like that and see how much that saliva comes down because it's a really good indication of what the acidity levels are a little bit disgusting uh wine tasting isn't nearly as romantic as you imagine it to be um but yeah I would think about the sides and the back of my mouth in particular can you explain the I think mouth movement whilst taste again how it works is this about moving the liquid around the mouth perhaps so what I'll do is just one more quick demonstration pick up a glass of water so I take a small sip and then I kind of put my lips as if I'm going to sort of kiss so a mouth sort of puckering shape like that and what I do is I let the sort of the liquid fall to the front of my mouth but to stop it falling out and to bring air through I suck in at the same time you might think of it a little bit like backward whistling almost and I'm looking to bring air through the liquid and it's that sort of air introduced and that oxygen introduced through the liquid that is going to help us detect different flavors. Okay, so let me just show you again a little sip of water. What's really important is that you tilt your head forward whilst you're doing that. If you tilt your head backwards, you're just going to gag and choke on the liquid coming to the back of your throat. Uh, won't introducing more air like that heighten the alcohol sensation? It can do. So lots of people's um, alcohol um, sensors, they're, they're most sensitive at the back of their throat. So that can sort of introduce more of it. At the level wine is, that should still most of the time not make the wine out of balance. What you'll notice if people tasting spirits is they're not going to do that big slurping sensation because the higher level of spirits, maybe up at 40 ABV, maybe above, um, that's going to cause such a kind of throat burning sensation that they won't be able to sort of taste the rest of the liquid. You don't need to do it in the same way. With wine, the risks are far lower because the alcohol is going to be far lower and that's sort of 12 to 14 percent for an average bottle. Um, what is it in some ways, uh, in some wines that make it linger on the tongue longer than other wines? Okay, so you, that's a really good question here. We talk about this as the finish in wine. Okay, so how long do positive flavours, aromas last on the palate? Sometimes when you taste the wine, you'll get the acidity lingering for a long time. Sometimes if you have um, a red wine, that tannic structure will hang around for a long time. If you've got really alcoholic wines, it might be a little bit of alcohol burn. That lingering around would not be considered a positive thing. As you do a tasting with WSET, what you'll learn is, right, we do our tasting, we make a descriptive note, and then we judge how good the wine is. And for higher qualities of wine, what we'll see is uh, flavours and that aromatic profile lasting. So how long can I taste that vanilla for? How long can I taste that pineapple for? That's different for everyone, okay? Everyone has different levels of sensitivities. Some people can pick up flavors really quickly and they linger for a long time, but you learn to scale that and calibrate it to someone who's experienced to understand, right, is this a short finish? Is this a medium finish? Is this a long finish? And it's those positive flavor characteristics, are they lasting? The thing that really impacts that is how, how concentrated were those grapes that go into it? Okay, I'm not going to go into big explanation about this, but basically, if you produce lots of grapes that aren't very concentrated in the plot of land, the flavors will be quite light and the flavors will probably not linger for very long. If you produce a small number of grapes, a small yield, but with really concentrated flavor profile, then those flavors can last for far longer. Okay, and that's a direct impact on quality. Good. Okay. 
So I think that is all the questions that come through uh, this evening. So thank you very much for asking those. Thank you for joining in. Um, my colleague is going to share a poll with you, just feedback about how you've enjoyed the session today. Please fill this in. Tell us if you enjoyed it or not. It really helps um, to influence what we put on next time for everyone. So that'd be really useful. We will share a link to this video with everyone that's attended today. As I said, recordings of all our past WSET Events Hub uh, webinars, they're available on our YouTube channel. So just go directly there and scroll through them. If you're really interested to get started, if this has inspired you a little bit, um, then go onto our website, wsetglobal.com, head to our Where to Study page, and you can see a full list of course providers near you, the courses they offer. Uh, click through to their website and you'll see how you can sign up directly. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Hope you've enjoyed uh, some wine tasting without wine and look forward to seeing you again next time.